morning. Uh, I'm Jisoo Kim, director of the GW Institute for Korean Studies and co-director of East Asia National Resource Center. I'm also Korea Foundation Associate Professor of History, International Affairs, and East Asian Languages and Literatures. I would like to welcome you to our Korea Policy Forum. We have a very special guest today, Deputy Assistant Secretary Mark Knapper. I would like to thank him for accepting our invitation and being here with us despite his extremely busy schedule. Um, we received almost 200 RSVPs, so we expect to receive many questions from the audience. So I'll try to cover as many questions as possible during Q&A. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box to write it there. And make sure you use Q&A, not the chat box, because I might miss your question if you use chat box. Um, this Korea Policy Forums event is co-sponsored by GWICS and East Asia National Resource Center. And this forum is made possible by the generous grant from KDI School of Public Policy and Management. My staff asked me to announce this. Um, so we'll be sending out the National Resource Center survey by email after the event. So you'll um, also see that link in the chat box. We'd appreciate it if you could fill out the uh, survey so that we can improve our virtual events. Um, thanks in advance for that. All right, now I would like to have the honor and privilege to introduce our distinguished speaker, Mark Knapper, a member of the Senior Foreign Service of the US Department of State. He has served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Korea and Japan since August, 2018. Prior to assuming this position, he was in Seoul as Charles Affairs from 2017 to 18 and Deputy Chief of Mission from 2015 to 16. Earlier assignments include Director for India Affairs, Director for Japanese Affairs, and multiple postings in Tokyo, Seoul, Hanoi, and Baghdad. He has twice worked in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, once in 1997 as the State Department representative to the spent fuel team at the Yongbyon nuclear facility and again in 2000 as part of the advanced team for then Secretary of State Madeleine Albright's visit to Pyongyang. He is the recipient of a number of awards from the U.S. Department of State, including the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award, the nation's highest diplomatic honor. He has also received the Linguist of the Year Award and three uh, Superior Honor Awards. Once again, it is a great honor to have him with us today. And uh, please join me in welcoming Deputy Assistant Secretary Mark Knapper. Okay, uh, thank you, Jisoo. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here today. Um, this is actually my first event with GWIC, so I'm really happy. You are, you know, you are our neighbors here at the State Department, so always, uh, always a pleasure. And then, really, I'm, I'm happy to be here. And hopefully, it won't be my last invitation to speak with you guys. Um, but I'm here today to talk about. Uh, U.S. and South Korean coordination in the Indo-Pacific, specifically uh, our, how we work together to ensure that our two policies, our Indo-Pacific strategy, South Korea's new Southern policy, how they how they link and interact and, and ultimately serve, uh, serve both of our countries and, and we believe the region as a whole. So I've got some prepared remarks, uh, which I'll uh, get through, and then I definitely want to leave time uh, at the end for, for questions uh, and hopefully answers as well. But let me start, uh, as, as everyone knows, and we're proud to say the US ROK Alliance is what we call the linchpin of peace, security, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. It's been this way for 70 years. Uh, these are ties, this is an alliance uh, that was forged through our shared sacrifice on the battlefield. And this, this alliance, this deep friendship uh, continues today. And in fact, has expanded uh, in, in many, many ways, perhaps that, that people in 1953 couldn't have envisioned. Uh, it's, this is a relationship now that is uh, very broad and very deep and encompasses uh, very dynamic investment ties, trade ties, uh, science, technology, health cooperation. Uh, the United States and South Korea are very proud of the fact that we share uh, universal values. Uh, we share values of democracy, human rights, rule of law, um, and we work very closely together to combat shared challenges, not just in the Indo-Pacific, uh, but also throughout uh, around the globe. So when we talk about our alliance, uh, traditionally, and, and when I first came to, to Korea uh, in the early 90s, uh, as, as, a young, as a young foreign service officer, you know, the, the relationship back then was very focused on the peninsula, was very focused on on meeting and if necessary, uh, defeating the North Korea threat. Um, but as I said, it's really evolved over the past three decades into a very broad relationship. And I think this is 
really thanks to and gone hand in hand with uh, Korea's own development, uh, Korea's own emergence on the global stage as a as an important power. Um, you know, we see Korea, Korean companies are active all over the world. Korea has global interests. Uh, Korea is is combating piracy in the Indian Ocean. Korea is a very active donor and partner in development assistance, uh, not just places like Southeast Asia, but, but in Africa, Latin America, the Pacific Islands. And so with Korea's emergence as a global player and an important regional power, uh, it's really turned our alliance into one that has, uh, has global reach. And so when we look at our alliance now, we look at it as one that is promoting our common objectives in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, which I think is is fair to say uh, we share with South Korea the view that the Indo-Pacific is 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 probably the greatest engine of global economic growth. And with that in mind, in in November 2017, the United States launched our uh, our vision for for um, a free and open Indo-Pacific. And this is it. Our vision um, is based on, on principles that we believe are widely shared throughout the region. And just to go through them, uh, we believe in ensuring freedom of the seas and the skies. Uh, we believe the importance of insulating sovereign nations from external coercion. Uh, we believe in the importance of promoting market-based economics. Uh, we believe in open investment environments, uh, fair and reciprocal trade, and finally, uh, we believe in the importance of supporting good governance and respect for individual rights. And, and part of, of these uh, principles and part of our, our effort to implement and actualize these principles is cooperation throughout the region, um, not just with, with major uh, multilateral institutions such as uh, ASEAN and APEC, uh, but also with, with partner countries. Uh, the Indo-Pacific, and, and the, the concepts and the principles inherent in the Indo-Pacific strategy that we have, uh, we don't believe it's unique to the United States, uh, even though the countries in the region uh, may have different visions uh, to some extent. I think fundament, fundamentally our, our efforts are complementary and, and guided by a shared commitment uh, to uphold the rules-based order in the region. Uh, so that brings us to South Korea's new Southern policy. And as, as has been outlined by President Moon himself and other leaders within South Korea, this is a policy that, that seeks to expand Korea's engagement with South Asia, with Southeast Asia, under uh, the three pillars of people, peace, and prosperity. And from the get-go, we really believed that this uh, new Southern policy uh, comported extremely well with our own Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, you know, it shares, for example, the focus on ASEAN, the importance of ASEAN centrality, and outlines uh, seven areas of, of focus uh, within the new Southern policy. So these are uh, comprehensive health and medical cooperation uh, with ASEAN and other countries, especially important in this era of, of COVID-19. Uh, sharing Korea's education and human resource development models, promotion of cultural exchanges, including, uh, of course, the, all the well-known Hallyu, uh, developing mutually beneficial trade relations and investment, cooperation in the development of farming and urban infrastructure, cooperation in future industries, and cooperation in, in non-conventional or, or untraditional uh, security issues. And so as part of our effort to, to deepen uh, U.S. and South Korea cooperation between our Indo-Pacific strategy and, and the new Southern policy, we convened uh, in August, this past August, our very first uh, dialogue, official dialogue between our two countries. And we had um, really for the first time ever experts from across each of our governments, um, in sort of interagency community, uh, and we're able to go in depth on very complicated issues like cybersecurity, uh, law enforcement, and also uh, in terms of specific regions, we talked uh, deeply about the Pacific Islands. And so we, we really do believe that um, this kind of dialogue, again, the first ever we had it in August, was, was an example of the kind of uh, sort of level of maturity that our alliance has reached, that we can talk about complex issues uh, and, and cooperation across complex issues in very concrete ways 
and we're moving um, moving forward smartly uh, to figure out ways to deepen and our coordination uh, throughout the region. And as part of this, uh, this past November, we released our second um, Indo-Pacific New Southern Policy Joint Fact Sheet with the Korean government, in coordination with the Korean government. And this, this document, which I commend to you, uh, should be pretty easy to find online, but it's the, it's the Indo-Pacific Strategy New Southern Policy Fact Sheet, uh, but it lays out many ways. And it's a, you, if you, once you see it, you'll see what a comprehensive document it is, but it really focuses on uh, the areas that, that are most obvious for our two countries to cooperate, namely enhancing economic prosperity, championing good governance, uh, investing in human capital, and ensuring uh, regional peace and security. So I'll go through some of these, these areas of cooperation quickly, just to give you, again, some, some idea of the kind of things uh, that the US and South Korea are doing together. So first, uh, in terms of enhancing economic prosperity, uh, it's based on the recognition that market-based economic systems, uh, private sector finance, adherence to rule of law, and open investment environments are sort of the key ingredients to driving the region's, the Indo-Pacific region's prosperity. So this effort is really focused on building whole of government cooperation between the US and South Korea to strengthen our cooperation, and particularly focused on development assistance, energy, and infrastructure. So, you know, one area, again, that, that really shows deep uh, ROK commitment and good cooperation with us is in health. And I think uh, South Korea really has made a priority of, of cooperating with the ASEAN countries in the field of healthcare uh, to and education, particularly education to promote pandemic preparedness. And also to take a look at after, uh, you know, once we get through the pandemic, uh, promoting economic resilience. And so, uh, together with the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, and Korea's own uh, COICA, so the Korea Overseas International Cooperation Agency, uh, with these goals of, of promoting pandemic preparedness, of uh, promoting economic resilience, uh, we're expanding our collaboration and have come up with a work plan uh, to, uh, to, to really focus not just on COVID-19, but also to take a look at, at within the, the, the pandemic and within the crisis, how can we uh, further our other goals of, of gender equality, uh, deepen sort of access to information technology, which as we've seen has been critical uh, in combating uh, the virus in places like South Korea, but also promoting um, sort of uh, youth education and youth understanding of, of health issues. Um, beyond our health cooperation, uh, we're looking at how we can deepen our infrastructure cooperation, as well as our cooperation to promote um, uh, access to, to energy in the region, and so in February, we, we held our first infrastructure finance working group, as well as a private sector roundtable on infrastructure cooperation. And in this meeting was uh, the South, with South Korea's uh, Export Import Bank, as well as the U.S. Um, International Development Finance Corporation, DFC. And it's, it's you know, looking for ways to engage on joint financing uh, opportunities for infrastructure projects in the Indo-Pacific, uh, particularly um, in Southeast Asia, in what we call the, uh, the you know, the Mekong, uh, the Mekong River region. Um, we're also looking at how we can deepen our cooperation to promote a quality infrastructure uh, under what, uh, what we've uh, created, the Blue Dot Network, which is an attempt to, to ensure that uh, infrastructure projects are done in a way that, um, that are transparent, that are, that have, Financing that doesn't leave recipient countries with, with heavy, uh, heavy, punishing sort of debt responsibilities, and, and are done in a way that promote rule of law and and anti-corruption efforts. So this is something that uh, the U.S. and South Korea are working closely on, uh, as well as our energy security. We we just had our seventh energy security dialogue in August, um, and as well as in September we had a, a policy forum on information. And communications technology. So, again, focused on Southeast Asia, but how can we work together to to promote joint training, cybersecurity capacity, uh, et cetera? And of course, when we talk about cybersecurity and we talk about information security, we talk about 5G. And this is something that, um, that our two countries, uh, including at the Prague 5G Security Conference in September, 
uh, but, but working uh, to ensure that Southeast Asian countries are educated about 5G and, and the perils of uh, working with what we call untrusted vendors, uh, companies like Huawei. And so, again, these well, all within the rubric, all within the sort of principle of promoting economic development, economic prosperity, these have all been areas just uh, to give you a sample of the kind of concrete things that we're doing together. These, it's not just all talk. It's uh, we're really proud of the fact we're we're getting down to business, rolling up our sleeves, and and doing real work together. Um, turning now to uh, another key area of of cooperation between the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy and the new Southern policy is uh, investing in human capital and championing championing uh, good governance. And so this is uh, for us. I mean, it's 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 very much focused on on enhancing well-being, livelihood, the welfare of of people both in South Asia and Southeast Asia. And this is not just it's a you know it's a public-private effort. It's it's both official development assistance, but also private sector-led investments uh, to to provide uh, citizens in this region with the skills and the resources uh, that they need to be able to participate in in the global economy. So once again. Another effort between COICA and USAID. Uh, we're working with, for example, the government of Indonesia uh, to support uh, the development of, of the public sector and to create government that's more responsive uh, to its citizens' needs. Um, we're also promoting uh, women's, women entrepreneurs in the region. Um, there is a uh, there's a program in South Korea called the Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative, or WeFi, which focuses on small and medium-sized enterprises owned by women throughout the region. And this is just another effort uh, that the U.S. is, is proud to, to be associated with. Um, talked, to, talked about some of the work we're doing together for fighting COVID uh, in terms of direct assistance, I mean, beyond education, but direct assistance to countries. The U.S., we provided 130 million uh, dollars to to Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands. Uh, Korea has also provided a, a very significant sum uh, to to deal not just with the direct health impacts, but also the non-health impacts of, of the, the pandemic, which would include uh, promoting uh, human rights and protecting the rights of vulnerable and marginalized groups, efforts to combat disinformation and hate speech. Um, and these are areas in which we got USAID um, but also uh, the K, uh, KDCA, the, the Korea D uh, Disease Control Agency, as well as the US CDC. Um, we're all working together on this, and specifically uh, in Southeast Asia in Cambodia, in which we're working uh, with the Cambodian government um, under the auspices of the Global Health Security Agenda to, to promote uh, public health surveillance and to, to uh, strengthen their pandemic and their emergency public health response system. Um, turning to, to the goal of ensuring peace and security, another area in which our two policies overlap extremely well in terms of our shared goal of promoting regional peace and, and stability, uh, we're working together to, to support our partners in the region uh, to overcome and, and address non-traditional security challenges, uh, transnational crime. Uh, so the US and South Korea working together with regional law enforcement agencies. Um, in the case of Korea, they have their national police agency has a, what's called a, it's called the K-COP wave program, which has been providing uh, police training equipment and uh, experience and expertise to law enforcement agencies in the Philippines and in Indonesia and Vietnam. Uh, the United States, for our part, we're working very closely with these countries as well uh, to the tune of $55 million. And so during our recent uh, dialogue we had, we, we coordinated with the Koreans on how best could their K-COP Wave program and our own efforts to promote law enforcement uh, expertise. You know, how you know how best can we can we align these efforts to ensure that we're not, uh, you know, our, our efforts aren't redundant or 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 duplicative, but instead complement each other and and uh, help to, to bolster each other, which is especially important. And I mean, in an area of scarce resources, uh, we need to do everything we can to make sure that we're not just throwing money at a problem that someone else is is already got covered. Um, in terms of maritime law enforcement, uh, the U.S. and South Korea are working together uh, to strengthen uh, and strength, to strengthen uh, law enforcement capacity and transparency to to help 
uh, partner countries, not just with equipment, but also best practices, and to, to ensure that they have the capability uh, to uh, sort of protect their own uh, sea areas and ensure that, for example, illegal fishing isn't taking place, of course, to, to promote counter piracy efforts. Um, but these are all areas in which uh, both the US and South Korea share, share a goal to, to make sure that partner countries like Vietnam, uh, like the Philippines, like Indonesia, have the ability to, um, to keep their own waters uh, free and safe and uh, to allow that their marine resources are protected. Uh, turning to the Pacific Islands, again, in, in the category of, of promoting security cooperation, uh, and in terms of non-traditional sense, of course, disaster response, humanitarian assistance are huge areas. And so we are, again, working with South Korea to ensure that our, our efforts directed towards those areas are complementary and support each other. Uh, the Korean government has a program. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a South Korea Pacific Islands climate prediction project, which is intended to build resilience uh, for these Pacific Island nations to natural disasters. And so the United States um, is partnering with South Korea uh, to provide funding as well. And so I think the Korean funding was supposed to run out in 2021. And so we are picking up where they left, you know, sort of a baton pass from, from the Korean government to our government to make sure that this program is able to continue uh, in a way that uh, allows Pacific Island nations to better prepare for natural disasters um, and to ensure that they're able to uh, not just withstand the disasters, but respond and, and recover quickly when, uh, when they are affected. But this is a perfect example of the kind of concrete work that we in South Korea are doing together, uh, coordinating our, our, our two strategies uh, for the benefit of, of the region. So I think, um, you know, I'd like to wrap up around here and, and uh, open this up for questions. I know people are, are very curious about a lot of things, uh, and I'm happy to, to respond as best I can. But let me just say that, that this alliance, um, our alliance that we share with Korea, it's, it has grown um, in a way that you know, 27, 30 years ago, when I first started, I could not have imagined. This is an alliance that uh, together we're working around the world, we're working together in the Indo-Pacific uh, to promote our shared values, to promote capacity of our partners, to promote um, values, shared values like democracy, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Um, these are efforts that together uh, is bearing fruit and uh, we're very proud of, of the cooperative relationship we enjoy with Korea. Um, again, we've got a vibrant bilateral relationship, but, but hopefully I've given you just a flavor uh, of the kind of work we're doing together uh, to promote uh, efforts beyond the peninsula, beyond just our immediate bilateral uh, interests and, and uh, bilateral challenges. And so um, this is something fully expect to continue. Uh, this is the kind of thing, this is the kind of effort I think that uh, that we'll see uh, continue to be promoted uh, beyond uh, beyond just this year, and, and we'll go into certainly the next and, and going forward. Absolutely hope that we can continue to build upon uh, the strengths our two our these two allies enjoy, and and that we will see uh, going forward further cooperation and even deeper coordination between our our two policies. So why don't I leave it there um, and turn it back to you, Jisoo. All right, thank you so much for that very comprehensive overview of um, cooperation between US and RK on this, you know, Indo Pacific strategy and the new Southern policy. Um, I, as, um, and also I'd like to mention that we'll make sure to invite you back. <laughs> Hope you don't have to reach well, we're, not, we're not doing yet today, so no commitment <laughs> until we're, we're completed the full hour. All right, um, so. Well, I think as a um, as a moderator, I think I'll use my prerogative to ask uh, the first question, and then we'll uh, cover um, the questions that we got from our audience. So, um, you know, we are now in the midst of uh, COVID nineteen, and uh, you know, we are um, even even with the vaccines. I think we may not be going back to uh, business as usual uh, for some time. So, what are the strategic challenges or uncertainties you see in enhancing this U.S. ROK corporate? Uh, in this area, like the Indo-Pacific strategy and the new Southern policy. So how can we overcome the kind of crisis that we are facing today? 
Yeah, well, thank you. And I, I think, I mean, rather than look at it as challenges, I, mean, I think I, I prefer to, you know, put a little bit of a spin on it and say the opportunities instead. I think, uh, you know, certainly it's been, it has been a challenge uh, to, to not be able to sort of do the kind of things we've traditionally done in person. Um, I think there is, there is a, um, there's a real premium on being able to sort of sit down and meet with our counterparts and, and hash things out directly. Uh, you, you can't really put a price on that. Um, so it's been, uh, it's been a challenge to sort of work through um, the various efforts we have underway to try and promote uh, our cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. And we've done all this uh, virtually over the past eight or nine months. And I'm extremely proud that we've done everything we've, we've been able to do, uh, you know, by, <laughs> by Zoom calls and, and other, other platforms. But I think going forward, uh, I think we've seen that, that this is a very resilient uh, relationship that we enjoy with South Korea, that in spite of the challenges and the technical hurdles and others, that we've, we've found a way to, to deepen our cooperation. Um, I'm very proud of, of what we've accomplished in terms of our health cooperation and proud but not surprised, frankly, because I think health is one of those um, kind of unsung, unheralded areas of cooperation over the years. Uh, that really came to the fore with this pandemic. I mean, we had, uh, if you go back to, well, decades, in fact, and we've had American researchers, Korean researchers, health experts, they've had a, a cooperative relationship in which, you know, Korean researchers would come to, say, uh, NIH, you know, the National Institute of Health here in the D.C. area and, and study, or they get, you know, they get their PhDs at an American university or do their postdoc work at an American university. We've had American Researchers and scientists, of course, travel to Korea to do the same thing. And, and building on this, these years of, of bridges being built between our experts, building upon the cooperation we had in 2014 when we had the Ebola crisis in West Africa, uh, the first country to raise its hand when we sought volunteers was South Korea. Um, and so our, our military medical experts worked together in Sierra Leone um, on, this, on this crisis in 2015. Uh, with the mayor's outbreak in Seoul, in Korea, actually, uh, we had uh, our CDC working with KCDC um, to, to, to come up with best practices. So it's, it's really, I mean, this past year has just shown us uh, that the kind of work we do every day that very often isn't, isn't noticed, or as I said, is, is kind of unheralded or unsung, I mean, really comes to the fore in a crisis like this and shows the strength and the quality of our, of our alliance. And so and of our friendship and, uh, and the kind of cooperative and close ties we have. So it has been a challenge, but I think it's also really been uh, a tremendous boost um, to, to the sort of non-traditional areas of USROK cooperation. And I think that was a boost to our efforts to deepen our Indo-Pacific New Southern Policy cooperation, because it showed that we're two allies that are, are fully capable of working together beyond the normal uh, sort of areas of cooperation that we think about, whether it's security or, or, or trade and economics. Great, great, thank you. Um, so here at GWIX, uh, we try to give priority to students whenever they ask questions. Mm -hmm. So this is a question by uh, a student, um, Editia Divekar, I hopefully I'm pronouncing the name right. Uh, she's from the School of Business. Um, so if you have any insights as to how a Biden administration would transform the foreign service, I would love to hear more on that end, specifically with the Korea-Japan relationship. Do you see Suga Moon having a stronger relationship than Korean presidents saw with Abe? You know, students always ask the most challenging questions. So. <laughs> but um, now for the first question, it's, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna have to uh, sidestep the, the question about a future administration a, a little bit, um, only because uh, at the moment I, I work for you know, the Trump administration, and I'm, I'm not really, I can't really speak on behalf of the incoming team just yet. So I'm sorry to, sorry to dodge the question. Um, as, as for Japan-Korea relations, I mean, you know, the United States, uh, uh, we've, uh, you know, I feel very strongly about the importance of a, of a positive and constructive uh, relationship between Seoul and Tokyo. It's something that, um, frankly, is in our interest as well, uh, to, to ensure that there's good cooperation between the ROK and Japan, as well as good trilateral cooperation among the three of us. Uh, you know, I think we've been encouraged recently by, by some conversations that are taking place between, between the two countries. And, um, you know, and I'm, I'm, 
I know that there are uh, national security experts in both countries and, and leaders in both countries who, who feel strongly about the importance of, of a good relationship as well. And so the U.S., um, you know, our role is, is to um, continue to, to encourage as we can, uh, you know, positive relations in a way that um, address sensitive history issues, which we know are, 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 are important to address. I mean, given in the U.S., we, we have our own history issues we're, we're regularly struggling with. And so are, we are well aware of, of the you know, importance of, of dealing with history in a way that promotes reconciliation. But at the same time, there's no doubt that that um, putting the two countries' relationship on a more positive path going forward is in everybody's interest. Um, you know, it's in nobody's interest for, for Japan and South Korea uh, to not get along, um, except maybe for, for <laughs> maybe, maybe only Pyongyang and Beijing would welcome that. Uh, certainly not us. And so, um, I, you know, we'll, we'll continue to do everything we can, uh, play a convening role, find ways to bring our three countries together, to show the value of, of good relations. Um, and, you know, that's something I think that will remain uh, very much at the forefront of our, our foreign policy. Thank you. Actually, many of our audiences, it looks like based on their questions, they're interested, they're already interested in the uh, next administration. Um, well, one uh, question, uh, I, uh, I don't know whether you'll be able to answer this, but this is um, a question from our visiting scholar uh, at GWICS, uh, Song Yi Kim. Among the Trump administration's RK-US alliance policies, what will the new uh, US administration necessarily inherit and what needs to be improved? Well, I think one, thing, you know, one issue we're continuing to work on um, is uh, people are familiar with the special measures agreement, the SMA, uh, which is, um, you know the the effort to to um, we 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 hope will will uh, you know make it a more fair share of the burden um, you know born born by both countries. Um, as everybody knows, uh, we've been uh, we've been out of status, so to speak. Uh, we haven't had an agreement since January first of this year, and it's uh, no secret as well uh, that we're uh, you know we've been frustrated. I think both sides have been frustrated by this, but. Um, you know, talks continue, uh, efforts on both sides continue. I think we're, both sides are sincerely committed to finding a way forward because it's in our interest, uh, it's in the interest of our alliance to do so and we'll continue to talk in a, in a sincere and respectful way, but, and, and with the shared goal of, of um, coming out of this on the other side with a, with a uh, you know, a burden that is more fairly borne as well as a, hopefully an alliance that has stronger capabilities. So that's, that's one area. I mean, I think one area in which, um, we'll see it going forward is, is going to continue. Um, I think, you know, we're, we'll continue to look forward to um, deepen even further our, our trade and investment and energy uh, cooperation. Um, you know, we, we uh, our trade relationship is, is uh, vital and, and as Korea is the U.S. sixth largest trading partner, um, you know, provides uh, American, uh, a great market for American farmers and ranchers, uh, not to mention um, American producers. Uh, also, you know, we, you know, American consumers and manufacturers rely on imports from Korea. And so this is a very beneficial, mutually beneficial relationship. Um, obviously, we'd like to see uh, the trade and goods uh, imbalance a little, uh, a little less uh, skewed uh, towards South Korea. Um, but um, but it is a relationship that benefits us, especially investment. Uh, Korean investment in the U.S. is significant. Um, these are these are important investments in, in places like uh, uh, LG's investment in Georgia, uh, Hyundai in Alabama, Kia in Georgia as well, uh, Samsung in Texas, Lotte Chemical in Louisiana, and on and on. Uh, Hanwha has got a major solar panel investment uh, in the South as well, and so these are these are great investments. These are which create great jobs for American workers, American families. And so we want to see that continue to grow too. Uh, not to mention Korean imports from the U.S. of energy. Um, I think Korea is the number one importer or the number one purchaser of American LNG. Um, we, I think it's the number two purchaser of American petroleum. And we're among the top uh, two or three countries uh, that supply um, energy to Korea, uh, which we're very proud. We think we're a a, a, an inexpensive and secure uh, supplier of energy. And um, I think when you look at 
when you talk about the U.S.-Korea security relationship, obviously it's it it is security in the traditional sense of of our alliance and and our commitments under our security treaty. But take it a step further, and you look at energy security, we think is a key aspect of our of security with a capital S. And so uh, we want to continue to be a supplier, preferred supplier of energy, to South Korea, and uh, we we'll want you know, another another area. I think we'll see continue into the future. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question um, from M. K. Kang, um, associate professor from CUNY. Uh, it's, this is quite a bit uh, broad question. What is the grand economic strategy of the U.S. government to countervail the rising economic influence of China in Asia? Wow, that is a big question. That's like a PhD <laughs> dissertation, I think. Um, no, I think you know. I'll just circle back to to our discussion about the new Southern policy and the Indo-Pacific strategy, and it's it really comes down to ensuring that that trade, at least in the region, I'll, and I'll focus on the region because I'm barely qualified to talk about the Indo-Pacific, let alone the rest of the world. Um, you know, I mean, I think what we're looking for is is trade that is free and fair. I think in reciprocal, I think we're looking to ensure that um, that our trade with our partners and others in the region is done in a way that's on a, on a level playing field uh, that's done without, um, you know, uh, that's that's done in a way that uh, ensures that the markets are allowed to, to, to function normally and freely and without undue influence from, from uh, state actors. I think we're looking to ensure that our intellectual property is protected um, as we engage with others in the region. I think we want to ensure that when, um, as countries seek development assistance or assistance in, in building their infrastructure, that it's done in a way, again, that they're not uh, faced with punishing uh, debt that they have to service for years and years. Uh, it's done in a way that promotes transparency, that, that promotes anti-corruption efforts. I think um, I mean, these are all part of our efforts and these are just the sort of basic rules of the road that it's, it isn't a U.S. thing, but I mean, it's something I think that's shared by Korea, that's shared by Japan and Australia and the EU and others in the region and around the world. And so I think I'm not sure if that gets to 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 Dr. Kong's question, but I think it does reveal, I mean, really the, the, the heart of our Indo-Pacific strategy really is is our desire to ensure that countries in the region, including the U.S., are able to trade and participate uh, in a way that's fair um, and that, that protects our intellectual property and it increases prosperity. Uh, for everybody involved. Thank you. Um, so next question from Joseph Bosco. Um, you have described a deep and broad range of cooperation between US and ROK. Has any of that changed under the Moon administration, particularly in the security area where our interest uh, is vis-a-vis -vis both China and North Korea have seemed to diverge? Well, I mean, I think, you know, so the, the efforts I described in terms of our, our regional and, 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 and global cooperation. I mean, this is, a lot of it is thanks to President Moon and his, his policy I mean, this, in the New Southern policy was his brainchild and uh, that of his administration. And so I think he deserves a great deal of credit for, for the sort of innovation and, and creativity in coming up with this and recognition that, that Korea is a global power. Korea is a regional powerhouse. And so uh, more and more of Korea's economic and, and uh, other, sort of future is, is it hinges upon good relations with Southeast Asia, good relations with the, uh, some of the larger economies in that region, not to mention others in South Asia. So yeah, I mean, President Moon, I think, have, had a real vision for, for expanding Korea's uh, regional footprint. And I think, uh, we, you know, we deserve great credit and our gratitude uh, for, for seeing how this new Southern policy could overlap with and complement um, United States' own Indo-Pacific strategy. So I would point to that. Um, and just in terms of, of the second part of the question, I mean, I take issue I, I, with, with the, the stipulation that our, our policies uh, towards North Korea have diverged. I, I don't think so. I think we've continued to enjoy very good cooperation and coordination uh, between our two governments, not just in terms of, of high level contacts, but also at the working level. And we have the, the working group in fact, that uh, coordinates very closely um, between our two governments on how to how to approach North Korea and how to ensure that our respective policies um, serve our shared goal of denuclearization, but also don't run afoul of, of the international community's uh, you know, will to to avoid uh, you know 
uh, to, to avoid sort of violating uh, the UN Security Council resolution sanctions. Um, and, and, you know, I was, for example, so we've got this week our Deputy Secretary, uh, Steve Began, who is also the Special Representative for North Korea policy, or DPRK policy, is, is going to Seoul. He's arriving on Tuesday. And so this will be a chance for him at a very high level uh, to engage and, and sort of coordinate and ensure that we're, you know, well set up for uh, the transition that, that's underway. Just uh, to follow up on that, actually, there were two journalists asking for that question, um, uh, Began's visit to Seoul. So um, will he um, meet any North Korean officials or is there any plan that he would also stop in Japan? So the, the, we came out with, there was a formal press, press announcement that came out uh, yesterday that discusses his visit. Uh, he's just going to Seoul and he's, he's going really to uh, discuss our, our, our shared goals vis-a-vis uh, -vis the peninsula, but also uh, to discuss, you know, how, how we can, uh, you know, continue to, to strengthen and deepen our two countries alliance. But the, uh, the, the, the sort of press statement that came out yesterday is, is the most authoritative uh, word at this moment on, on his visit. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Mia uh, Tanaka. Uh, hi, thank you for doing this. While the free and open Indo-Pacific vision has evolved over the past years, President-elect Joe Biden seems to prefer using a different term, secure and pros prosperous Indo-Pacific. Are you worried that this tweak in language will change the nature of the concept, particularly in facing up to China's rise? Um, again, I'm going to be kind of careful and, and squirrely here and, and not try to characterize, uh, you know, what the president-elect uh, has said. Um, but suffice to say that I think our, our interest in and commitment to and reliance on the Indo-Pacific as as the sort of the engine for economic prosperity, as the source of, of uh, you know American sort of strong security interests, um, you know that's that's enduring, and you know i you know I'm not going to try and uh, characterize sort of how it was described in phone calls with other leaders, um, but just yeah just to to, to reemphasize that that I think our our policy is uh, you know it, it's it's if you look at sort of how it's evolved over the years uh, from previous administrations, um, including the Obama administration, now until whatever happens in the future, I mean, the one constant has been the U.S. commitment to the region, uh, the commitment to our alliance relationships in the region, and the realization of the fact that uh, the, the engine of, of American growth and American economic prosperity uh, lies, lies in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Andrew Yaw at uh, from Catholic University. Um, the joint fact sheet offers several concrete steps the US and ROK have taken to enhance cooperation at the operational level, covering energy, infrastructure, and health issues, among others. However, there seems to be very little discussion for cooperation at the strategic level, in large part because the NSP presidential committee sees the NSP as a functional, not a strategic agenda with uh, ASEAN India. As an alliance partner, how is the U.S. encouraging South Korea to ensure that South Korea remains a relevant player in shaping its regional security environment, given Seoul's reluctance to expand its peace pillar beyond non-trad security issues? Well, first of all, thank you for reading the fact sheet. Um, great. Uh, just people out there uh, are noticing it and paying attention. Um, you know, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think... It's it's the fact that, um, that that President Moon and his government took the step to to come up with this vision uh, for Korea's engagement with the region, and then to to take steps to actualize it. I think um, sort of part and parcel of that is is the realization, uh, sort of the strategic realization of the importance of this part of the world um, to Korea and to Korea's future uh, economic and and other security. Um, and it's certainly something that we discuss at a very high level. Um, and I can't remember exactly when it was, but uh, during one of the, either when President Trump was in Seoul or it might've been one of their phone calls with President Moon. I mean, this was a subject of discussion in which both, both leaders agreed of our shared, the shared importance of 
coordinating our Indo-Pacific strategy with the new Southern policy. So, um, you know, I think that's just, that's sort of in and of itself shows, I mean, there has been a strategic decision made that Korea needs to engage region-wide, that it's a regional power, and that as the world's 11th or, or 10th, by some accounts, largest economy, uh, Korea has to play a role commensurate with its, its economic strength. And I think uh, just turning it around, I think this is welcomed by others in the region. I, uh, I served in Vietnam more than 10 years ago, but even then uh, there was a sense, at least among you know, my counterparts in the Vietnamese government, just how, how important it would be for, for Korea to play, to play a role in addition to the role played by, by, by Japan. And I think uh, you know, part of this is um, part of this, this uh, feeling of, of welcoming Korea is, is, first of all, it's intrinsic, I think, just to Korea and Korea's own efforts and contributions. But I think it's also part of it is, is thanks to the alliance relationship they, they share with us. And that when, when the more that Korea uh, takes part in efforts region wide and, and the more that they're involving its ally and partner, the United States, I think the more that that helps to tie us together to the region in a way in which our, it's obvious to all that we, we share the goal for regional stability, we share the goal of, of, of regional prosperity. And so the more that we in South Korea can work together in this area, I think it's, it's, it's uh, much stronger than the sum of its parts. Thank you. Um, so we have two questions about uh, Taiwan, but I think I'll uh, just group them into one Taiwan related question. So what is your assessment of the relationship of Taiwan with the Republic of Korea and Japan? Is it static or has there been change in recent years, especially with um, Tsai Ing-wen as, as president of Taiwan? Where do you see this going moving forward? Well, um... Not being a, an expert on Taiwan, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to sort of go into too much uh, detail, and I'll probably, you know, say something incorrect. But, but I mean, uh, the United States believes very strongly in ensuring that Taiwan, uh, Taiwan's international space is is protected, respected, expanded, and this includes participation in in international organizations and efforts like the World Health Assembly, which is part of the World Health Organization, um, and you know we've express concern when we've seen um, PRC efforts to, for example, flip countries' diplomatic recognition from Taiwan to the PRC. Um, this, of course, doesn't serve the goal of, of ensuring that Taiwan has uh, international space. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're regularly encouraging others in the region, like-minded partners, allies, uh, countries that share, share democratic values and, and share Kind of values that are increasingly under threat throughout the region um, by the PRC to speak up when they see um, when they see these kind of activities and actions taking place. And so, uh, to the extent that um, you know, both I mean, both Japan and South Korea, of course, have very vibrant, unofficial relations with Taiwan, uh, just as we do. And so, we uh, we certainly hope that, and then are gratified when when we see both Japan and the ROK speaking up in support of. Uh, you know, Taiwan's democracy and Taiwan's efforts to, to maintain its international space. Thank you. Um, so next question by James Hildbrand. Do you see any opportunities to link new U.S. ROK efforts in Southeast Asia with robust U.S.-Japan efforts in the region, such as the Japan-U.S. Mekong Power Partnership and uh, JUSEP? Alternatively, could those U.S.-Japan efforts provide a model for U.S. ROK bilateral cooperative efforts? I'm going to say yes and yes. I think I think it would be great if we could find a way. Uh, to, to your first question, James, uh, you know, if there's a way we could find a way to to build upon existing efforts between the U.S. and South Korea, existing efforts between South between the U.S. and Japan, and and you know, make it a trilateral effort. I mean, that's um, it won't always work. It won't always be appropriate. Um, but if there's ways we can do it, absolutely, we should try to do it. Uh, it makes sense, again, in an era when we're all dealing with, with uh, scarce resources and uh, limited budgets, the more that we can do together bilaterally, and in this case trilaterally, uh, the better. And it just, uh, especially if we're all sort of rowing in the same direction anyways, uh, we ought to be doing that. And yeah, and then to your second part of your question, is there, uh, can, can U.S.-Japan efforts like the, you know, Japan-U.S. Mekong Power Project or JUSEP 
the joint, the, the Japan-U.S. Strategic Energy Partnership. Can these be models? Absolutely. Um, I think it, it makes sense. I mean, why, um, you know, why no need to reinvent the wheel. And if we have a uh, good productive effort in sort of energy security space that we have with say, Japan, if it makes sense to be able to duplicate that with Korea, all the better. Um, it, I think it makes good sense. Um, you know, we don't want to, um, you know, obviously we don't want to shoehorn something in that just that doesn't make sense. I mean, it has to make sense and we can't do it just for the sake of doing it. But I, I think that going forward, we're absolutely going to be on the lookout for ways that we can expand bilateral cooperation to trilateral. I mean, in the case of, of some of our efforts with Japan, it's already trilateral with Australia. And so if we can add Korea to that mix, all the better. I think it's, uh, I mean, there's no reason why we, we shouldn't be able to look for ways to expand and multilateralize further our, our cooperation. Thank you. Um, next question by Eduardo Batista from South China Morning Post. What risks for South Korea would you say there are in a deepening economic relationship with Beijing? Without getting out my crystal ball, I mean, I can, I can just point to recent history and uh, sort of point to what happened um, after May 2017 with the THAAD deployment to Songju and uh, the resultant economic coercion and uh, you know, punishment that China decided it was going to levy upon South Korea and South Korean companies. Um, you know, the, the reason that there are no more uh, Lotte Marts in China is because the PRC authorities uh, took steps to punish um, Lotte for selling this golf course to the Korean government and essentially uh, using kind of spurious regulatory uh, efforts, uh, essentially closed down every, every Lotte store in, in, uh, in China. Um, there's a reason Hyundai Motors uh, sales of, of automobiles is down, has been down 50% over the last three years. There's a reason why uh, cosmetics sold by Korean companies, their sales are down. There's a reason Chinese tourists for a while weren't coming to Korea anymore. I mean, these were actions that the Chinese government, the PRC authorities took as economic retaliation uh, for the THAAD deployment. So um, not exactly sure you'd call that the... Um, the efforts of, of, of a friendly nation vis-a-vis uh, -vis Korea. And so I think it's um, caveat emptor when you're dealing with the PRC, buyer beware. And then as with, with a deepening economic relationship, I think you're gonna you're obviously increase the leverage uh, that Beijing has should they uh, you know, become cross with, uh, with Seoul about, about something. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's certainly something that's not unique to Korea. Other countries in the region have seen it, Japan, uh, saw their rare earths uh, imports from China get cut off after you know the dispute with the Senkaku Islands. We saw Philippines and uh, their banana sales to 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 China were, were cut off after, over a dispute in the South China Sea several years ago. Um, of course, Australia is going through that right now. Norway went through it. Their salmon salmon sales to to China were cut off when Norway awarded a Nobel Peace Prize to a Chinese dissident and so on. So I think, um, it's like, I mean, there's no question. I mean, obviously Korea has a very important and lucrative relationship, economic relationship with, with China, but um, you know, there are uh, definitely downsides. I think I'll ask one more China related question. Uh, so from Bill Brown, China is both of our country's biggest trade partner are we working together to create some kind of trade agreement with China that solves ongoing issues with regard to non-competitive practices by China's government? Um, not that I'm aware. I mean, right now, you know, the focus of this administration is, has been on, on bilateral efforts. So of course, you know, bilateral with, with South Korea, we, um, we revised our chorus free trade agreement uh, with Japan, we we came up with phase one of a trade agreement. Of course, with China, we have a you know trade deal, and so it's more focused on a bilateral efforts rather than you know sort of working with Korea um, towards towards say China. Okay, uh, thank you. So I think we'll uh, we have three more minutes, but I think I would like to ask just two more questions <laughs> if you don't mind. Uh -huh. um, what does, a uh, question from Chungo Kim, what does South Korea's demand for transfer of wartime operation control imply to you, uh, imply for future US-Asia strategy? Sure, so Opcon uh, 
So yeah, work time operational control, or we call it on for short. Uh, and I'm not really at liberty to get into too much detail about that. These are ongoing discussions, but certainly this is you know part of a bilateral agreement we made many, many years ago. Uh, talks are ongoing, and of course, I mean, they share, I mean, the, the ultimate goal though is to ensure that our alliance is fully capable of, of meeting um, you know, any and all challenges uh, in the years ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last question from um, our graduate student, who is, I think, interested in um, uh, becoming a future foreign officer. <laughs> wow. The question is uh, by Sarah Jung. Um, I'm majoring in Korean studies because I want to be involved in US-Korea relations in the future. I also would like to expand my functional expertise as well as my area expertise. May I know what your functional expertise was in graduate school? How did you choose your functional expertise? Well, thanks, Sarah. And I, I thank you for your interest. I, I certainly, and maybe offline, if you have other questions about the Foreign Service, we can figure out a way to, to connect. But I think it's great that you're interested. It's a great career. Um, it's really, it's, it's an honor to serve, uh, not just, um, the United States, but also to serve, in this case, uh, you know, to serve on behalf of the U.S. ROK relationship. Um, and uh, I was, uh, I did politics and international relations in college and in grad school, and so I sort of gravitated towards uh, being a political officer. But we have other functions in addition to pol political officers. We have economic officers, diplomacy, uh, consular, uh, management, um, sort of all aspects of of State Department work. Um, but it's it's uh, it's been a lot of fun, um, you know. Language, it, I would say, if uh, focus on language learning as well. If, if if in addition to perhaps you already have Korean, but if you have other languages, um, that's absolutely a plus, uh, and, and and is looked upon favorably uh, when you join. Um, but yeah, keep it up. I know that uh, it's uh, the test can be challenged, and sometimes it's not off, offered as often maybe as as one would hope. But um, but hope you can stick with it. Thank you so much for that advice and also uh, attending to all of uh, the questions uh, that were addressed. Thank you so much. Uh, it has been a great pleasure to have you once again at GWIX and hopefully uh, we'll be able to work together once again in the future. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you so much, Mark, for your time. Yeah, thank you too, and thanks to your colleagues. I really appreciate the great chance for me. Thank you. Thank you. And also for our audience, thank you so much for participating. And also, um, we would appreciate if you could fill out the survey uh, when you receive it in your email. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.